Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over exactly what you need to know and be able to do for the electricity topic in the National 5 Physics course. Now remember, you can download your own free copy of this learning outcomes document from my website, mrmitchellphysics.co.uk and look for the National 5 section of the website. So let's get started. Now you may remember that the electricity topic for the National 5 Physics course is split into five sections. So we have electrical charge carriers as section one, we then have the second section being potential difference, i.e. voltage. The third section is all about Ohm's law. The fourth section is called practical electrical and electronic circuits. And lastly, we have electrical power. So we're going to look at each section in turn to see what you need to know. So for the first section, electrical charge carriers, you need to be able to define electrical current as electric charge transferred per unit time. So that is a straightforward definition that you just need to know. The second one there says use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving charge, current and time. So you need to be able to use this equation Q equals IT to rearrange for Q, I and T depending on what you're asked to find. And remember you get this equation on the relationship sheet in your exam. And remember the units of these things, charge is measured in coulombs, current in amps or amperes and time in seconds. Next it says to know the difference between alternating and direct current. So remember direct current is when current flows in one direction only at all times and alternating current is where the current changes direction every fraction of a second. So it goes back and forth and some examples of DC and AC supplies are for DC you've got a battery being a direct current source and for an alternating supply you've got the mains which is every time you plug something into the wall. Lastly for section one it says to identify a source either as AC or DC based on oscilloscope traces or images from data logging software. So you should remember that the oscilloscope trace for DC is a straight line along the way showing a constant output voltage, whereas an oscilloscope trace for an AC source shows a wave pattern, and that is showing an alternating voltage. For section two, potential difference, i.e. voltage, you need to know that a charged particle will experience a force in an electric field. You should also know the path that a charged particle will take when it's between two oppositely charged parallel plates, near a single point charge, between two oppositely charged points, and between two like charged points. So what this is really saying is you need to know what the electric field lines look like and therefore what is going to happen if you bring a charge close to those charges that are producing the electric field lines. And so remember if you take a positively charged particle and you place it between two oppositely charged parallel plates, the positive charge will move away from the positive plate and towards the negative plate. So it always moves positive to negative. Near a single point charge, if we have a single negative charge, then the positive charge that we take near it is going to be attracted towards it, but if it's a single positive point charge, then our positively charged particle that we bring near it is going to be repelled away. If we brought a positively charged particle between two oppositely charged points, it would move again from positive to negative if it was between the two points, and round the outsides of the charges, it would do the same as what it would do near the single point charges. And lastly, between two like charged points, Remember, in the middle between the two, there is going to be electric field lines cancelling out where they're going to be repelling each other. So if we bought a positively charged particle in between two positive point charges, for example, then the positive charge is going to be repelled away from them. Lastly, for section two, it says to know that the potential difference, i.e. the voltage of the supply, i.e. the battery, is a measure of the energy given to the charge carriers in a circuit and the charge carriers are the electrons. And this is the definition of voltage or potential difference that you need to know. So it's the measure of the energy given to the charges in a circuit. Another way of thinking about this is that one volt is equal to one joule per coulomb. Moving on to section three, Ohm's law, we have calculate the gradient of the line of best fit on a VI graph to determine resistance. So VI graph means voltage current graph. So remember the gradient of the line of best fit on a voltage current graph, which for an ohmic conductor should be a straight line through the origin that gives you the resistance. So you need to be able to calculate the gradient by doing the change in y over the change in x, or y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Next, it says to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving potential difference, i.e. voltage, current, and resistance. So for Ohm's law, we have V equals IR, voltage equals current times resistance. And then we have two other relationships that can be used to find potential difference or voltage. And these are our potential divider formulas. So we've got V2 equals R2 over R1 plus R2 times V Yes, which is our equation for potential dividers where the supply voltage is known. And then we've got this one where the supply voltage is not known, which is a ratio of voltages is equal to the ratio of resistances. Now notice for this one as well, it starts with V2, 
but it depends on what you label your resistors to be. So if you were using one, for example, and you wanted to find V1, then remember the top resistor has to be R1 in that case. So you could have V1 equals R1 over R1 plus R2 times Vs as well. But potential dividers are typically done in section four, practical electrical and electronic circuits, which we'll come to later. It then says to know the qualitative relationship between the temperature and resistance of a conductor. So this is basically saying that temperature affects resistance for conductors. So as the temperature of a conductor increases, the resistance increases as well. And we looked at this when we did non-ohmic conductors, such as the light bulb, where temperature for the light bulb is going to be increasing, and this causes the resistance to increase as current increases. And remember this is because as temperature increases in the conductor, the atoms of the conductor material are going to be vibrating more, which is going to increase the resistance to the flow of electrons, i.e. the flow of current. And lastly, for section three, it says to describe an experiment to verify Ohm's law. So you need to be able to describe briefly what goes on in the experiment for Ohm's law. So remember that involves connecting up a simple circuit with a power supply, some wires and a resistor, and then you can measure the current in the resistor and the voltage across the resistor using an ammeter and a voltmeter respectively. And for even steps in current, you can write down the voltage values. And then you can plot a graph of voltage on the y-axis against current on the x-axis, and you should get a straight line through the origin. Moving on to section four now, practical electrical and electronic circuits. You need to be able to measure current, potential difference, and resistance using appropriate meters in simple and complex circuits. So you need to be able to use ammeters for current, voltmeters for voltage, and ohmmeters for resistance. Next, it says to know the circuit symbol, function, and application of standard electrical and electronic components, such as the cell, battery, lamp, switch, resistor, voltmeter, ammeter, LED, motor, microphone, loudspeaker, photovoltaic cell, fuse, diode, capacitor, thermistor, LDR, relay, and transistor. So hopefully all of these terms ring a bell if you've studied this topic already, but you need to go back and look at the circuit components table that we did in the video on circuit components, which showed you the circuit symbol and the function and it told you what they were. And it's useful for some of them to know some applications of where you would actually use them and why. Next for transistors, it says to know the symbols for an NPN transistor and an N-channel enhancement mode MOSFET, and explain their function as a switch in transistor switching circuits. So you should know the circuit symbols for the NPN transistor and the MOSFET, and you should know that transistors are quite simply electronic switches. Next, it says to apply the rules for current and potential difference in series and parallel circuits. So you should know that in a series circuit, the current is the same at all points. So we could say that with IS equals I1 equals I2 equals dot dot dot. And you should also know that the voltages across the components in a series circuit add up to give the voltage of the supply. So VS equals V1 plus V2 plus dot dot dot. For parallel circuits, however, we sort of have the opposite rules. So you should know that current in a parallel circuit splits up through each branch. So we could say that IP equals equals I1 plus I2 plus dot dot dot. And we should also know that the voltage across each branch in a parallel circuit is equal to the voltage across the battery. So we could say VP equals V1 equals V2 equals dot dot dot, where S means series here and P means parallel. Next, it says to know the effect on the total resistance of a circuit of adding further resistance in series or in parallel. So all this means is when we add up resistors in series, remember they all add together. So that means the total resistance increases in series if we keep adding resistors. But if we have a parallel circuit and we keep adding resistors in parallel, then that is going to decrease the total resistance. And lastly, for section four, it says to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving the total resistance of resistors in series and in parallel circuits and in circuits with a combination of series and parallel resistors. So that is the combination circuits or mixed circuits. So here's our two relationships. This one RT equals R1 plus R2 plus dot 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 for resistors in series. And then this one for resistors in parallel, which is an inverse relationship. One over RT equals one over R1 plus one over R2 plus dot dot dot. Lastly, section five is electrical power. And it says that you need to be able to define electrical power in terms of electrical energy and time. So you should know that electrical power is the rate at which energy is transferred or it's the electrical energy transferred each second. So that's a definition there. And then it says use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving energy, power, and time. So you need to be able to use this relationship, power equals energy divided by time, where power is measured in watts, energy is measured in joules, and time is measured in seconds. It then says to know the effect of potential difference, i.e. voltage and resistance on the current in and power developed across components in a circuit. And we can do that using these relationships to see how power depends on other variables. So it says here, use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving power, potential difference, 
current and resistance in electrical circuits. So we can calculate power using current and voltage from P equals IV. We can calculate power from current squared times the resistance from P equals I squared R. And we can also calculate power from voltage squared divided by resistance with P equals V squared over R. So remember it depends on what you're given in a question as to which of these equations you would want to use. So in summary we have four power equations that you could use. And lastly for section 5 it says to select an appropriate fuse rating given the power rating of an electrical appliance. So you need to know that a 3 amp fuse should be selected for most appliances rated up to 720 watts, but a 13 amp fuse should be selected for appliances rated over 720 watts. So remember that that cut off number of 720 watts. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching, if you made it to the end I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video one of these, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.